Knowing what you know is important, but knowing what you don't know is even more important. With that in mind, can you qualify what leadership is not? So yeah, look, leadership, if I put it into a really basic form, leadership is not about your length of time or seniority or, or duration of how, how much you've been here at the club. It can be two minutes, it could be two years, it could be 20 years. It doesn't matter. It's, um, it's not about your skill set, it's not about your seniority. It's, it's about you as an individual. And uh, a lot of people get that mixed up, that they think that you know, I've automatically got to have the uh, senior player or the senior person who's been here the longest automatically just fall straight into that leadership role. It's not necessarily the case. You know, people can turn up and instantly command leadership and be a leader without actually having been here for a long time. All right, so rather than pigeonholing someone because of their masculinity or femininity, um, I think that the, the ability for someone to absorb it or you know, to have, particularly say, let's say the women's team, they can understand the, the, the social pack, but I think they're more resilient than what we give them credit for. Um, because of just the things that they enjoy, you know, I'm going to play Aussie rules. There's a stigma associated with that straight away, you know, and there's a perception of who they are or what they are. Now, that develops resilience and strength. So in a way, they will they will understand this really easily. So given that, is that an indicative form of leadership in its own right? We always say that in a team, you know, that, that leaders can come in any form. Uh, you don't have to be a leader or to have a title to take that role. But, you know, naturally, these girls particularly, they are born out of something that they want to be. And they, they're, they're taking on a, um, a new life, a new role, a new a sort of a trailblazer into a football that creates leadership, absolutely. So what role then does social influence play in leadership? Social influence plays a, a big role, a big part of it, right? So it's, it's not about the popularity, okay, of any given person. Uh, it, in more terms, it is more about doing what's right, doing the uh, not necessarily what everyone's going to agree with and what's popular and what's cool, but what's doing the right thing and doing it consistently. How much does the role of vision play in leadership? Vision uh, is, is really important from the, from the perspective of you have to think beyond today and beyond tomorrow. We're thinking future. We're thinking weeks, months, years ahead. We want to be able to have a leader that um, can see the greater good that's not necessarily about, you know, oh, tomorrow we're gonna to do this. No, no, no. We create a, uh, a method or a plan to be able to succeed far greater, far further. So given social influences and the news and that sort of thing, why then, why does it, a leader need to be optimistic? It's an interesting one. It's not necessarily about being fake or always seeing the good in things and not necessarily trying to make good out of bad, right? But Optimism gives um, a sense of learning. Without getting emotional, you can keep the pe people up and about so they can receive information better. And if, if someone gets down or something goes wrong, it tends to fall apart very quickly. So a good leader keeps everyone up and about, receiving information well, and being able to see that there's something good happening. Given social influence, vision, and optimism are all part of leadership, can you briefly describe the different leadership styles? Yeah, so there's a few different ones and they all have their, their moment and they all have their role in our um, society. There's the, uh, the democratic one, you know, the most common and the most effective and that's where everyone, you take a piece of information from everyone, it's a team goal, team orientated type of leadership role. Uh, there's the, you know, the very emotional, empathetic and they, they combine all the, um, all the emotions of the, of the team and keep them up and about and use that as sort of like an invoking passionate type of side. Uh, there is the uh, more sort of dominating commanding presence. That's um, someone that you know, can slide into dictatorship and we don't want that necessarily. But at one point in time or another, someone has to be confident enough to be able to stand and say, no, that's not how we will behave. So Obviously there's lots of different situations we find ourselves in and as you just mentioned, four different styles of leadership. How does adaptability affect a leader in their everyday role? Yeah, so they've got to be able to change and move. Any game, 
any team, any place, any social group. So you can be in a different place, um, in a different, you might be at, at a club sponsors venue, and we have to adapt to that venue or to that style of what, where, we're at, where we are. Uh, a certain game may require us to change again and, and change a team. We might be on the back foot and, and copying a different playing style than we were prepared for. We have to adapt and we have to adapt fast. So we've spoken about the ability to be adaptable and with your communication especially. So what is effective communication and how vital is it uh, as a part of leadership? So the communication part would be that for me, delivering a message that's not overly emotional uh, and being able to communicate in a way that everyone understands without letting things get too much and be personal. Uh, a good communicator can deliver a message in a way um, that certain different t styles need. And that's part of that adaptability, being able to change the flow of your message to a different person, uh, but also receiving too. So understanding that you know your role here isn't to dominate and command me, it's, it's to encourage me or lead me and, and walk beside me. Um, so with that message, yeah, they've got to change. Given that we are in the process of selecting leaders for the football club, can confidence be perceived as something else? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, an age-old uh, saying that arrogant versus confident, you know, and they can easily blur between the two. So the difference being, an arrogant person can have a great skill set, great ability, great amount of knowledge, but doesn't have the calm and methodical way a confident person can deliver the same. So a confident person with less skill can actually be more effective than an arrogant person. So now that we understand that, what do leaders need to understand about genuine confidence? See, the, the, the confident part would be, from, from my perspective, is that they understand and have spoken with the group. They've all made a common goal, a common good, and they understand what they, that they're confident in the message. Right, so they're confident in their training, they're confident in what their, their, their playing style is going to be or the club picture of what they want is, and they go about it with that confidence. Um, not dominating with arrogance and standing over and saying, I know what I'm talking about. No, no, no. It's just being able to succinctly say, we've, we've discussed this, we know what the message is and we go through it. We've covered many areas of leadership and what it means to be a leader, how to be a leader, and the importance of the role within the community and the club. Deciding on leaders is vital to success. How should you assess a leader's decisiveness in this process? I, I think if you bind the, particularly the communication, uh, the adaptability and the confidence part, and you, and you get a real decisive person that, that's going to use those skills to be able to go. So to being able to um, create it or decide upon it, um, it kind of naturally flows. Now I'm not saying to you that a leader will jump out in a group, but they will naturally form that role. They naturally want to be able to speak and they want to be able to, to succinctly deliver what the coach's message is, what the committee's messages are, what the board's messages are, what the social group out here are, what the fans want. You know, that, that decisiveness is what, you know, the, the D in demons. You know, it's, it's about delivering a, a strong message and being able to back it up because you've got the confidence, you've got the message, you've got the, the, um, the team behind you, you know, that they put you there, they put you there for a reason. Given the mission statement of the football club that sits yeah. behind you and choosing leaders to go forward, do we need to consider all of these objectives and things that have been worked on in the past to create the culture that now exists within the football club? If I was going to select a leader, uh, I want the person who, for me, oozes the message of who we are. You know, and that is, yeah, the, the club ethos is the, the team first attitude. You know, we're, we want to be about family. My family is out, in the, out on the field, off the field. My family is, is my club. Um, the, the ability to find the leader out of that will quickly form through training. You're going to see the guy in the back of the group that's going to be constantly yapping. You're going to see the girl who's going to be constantly around the players, patting them on the bum, saying, let's go, come on, let's get up and go. Um, it's always there. They rise to the top. It's like cream. They sit there and they're above the whole lot and they help everyone. They don't push anyone down. They're always the one with the hand picking someone up off the ground. Um, and that's what we're about, team first. We help each other. We, we're always lifting each other up. We're not pushing each other down.